In a previous video, I went over DNA replication as it occurs in a simple prokaryotic organism like E. coli. The basic mechanism is the same in eukaryotic cells, but with a lot more molecular players and some differences in the details. Having said that, there are a couple of replication-related issues that eukaryotic organisms have to deal with that prokaryotic ones don't, by virtue of the fact that the structure of eukaryotic chromosomes is different from that of prokaryotes. One key difference we see is that eukaryotic organisms' DNA is found in the form of chromatin, a DNA protein complex that serves to organize and compact the DNA within the nucleus. Prokaryotic DNA is not found in the form of chromatin. In eukaryotic cells, the DNA molecule is wrapped around a complex of histone proteins to form a bead-like structure called a nucleosome, with one nucleosome every 200-ish base pairs or so on average, though that can vary. This beads on a string structure is then coiled up into a cylinder, and this cylindrical fiber is wrapped up further, in association with lots of other proteins, to condense the DNA even more. As I've alluded to previously, and we'll see in more detail when we discuss gene regulation later in the course, the level of compaction, or how tightly condensed the chromatin structure is, varies across the genome and dictates the extent to which gene expression occurs. Chromatin that is less condensed is associated with more gene expression, and more compact chromatin is associated with less gene expression, or even the silencing of genes that the cell doesn't need to express. The chromatin structure is regulated by a large set of chromatin remodeling proteins, and they have an enormously important job to do in that they are essentially controlling which genes are going to be expressed and how much. So how does this pertain to replication? In order for the DNA replication machinery to gain access to the DNA it's copying, that DNA has to be exposed. So as helicase moves along the DNA, the chromatin structure has to be disassembled. The DNA has to be unwound from the nucleosomes so that the two parent DNA strands can be exposed and copied as we see here in this illustration. This is representing a replication fork with helicase represented here in yellow moving to the left and the leading strand up here and lagging strand down here being copied by DNA polymerases represented as these green and yellow complexes here. This is eukaryotic DNA replication, so the specific proteins are different than in E. coli, but the idea is the same. These spheres are representing the histone beads that DNA is wrapped around. And as we can see in front of the helicase, the chromatin structure is still intact. And as the helicase moves through this region, that chromatin structure has to be taken apart to expose the DNA. But here's the kicker. Once the DNA has been copied, both of these copies have to be rewrapped around nucleosomes and the chromatin structure has to be reassembled to match what was in the parental DNA. Otherwise, gene expression is going to be thrown completely out of whack. Genes that are supposed to be silenced in this cell lineage, or at this time in the life of the cell, are going to be inappropriately expressed. This is an enormous task, and it's controlled by chromatin remodeling proteins, represented as these different globular structures we see interacting with the chromatin and replication machinery at the replication fork and behind it, controlling how that DNA histone chromatin scaffold gets reassembled after it's duplicated. You don't have to know any of the details of how this happens, much of which isn't well understood in any case. This is an active and fascinating area of research with all sorts of implications for human diseases, including cancer. But I just wanted to briefly introduce you to this really interesting topic while we're on the subject of replication. The other key difference for eukaryotic DNA is that the chromosomes are linear rather than circular, and this causes an end replication problem that prokaryotes don't have. Remember, prokaryotes have a circular chromosome. Replication starts at the origin, and two replication forks proceed all the way around that circular chromosome until they meet at the other side, and there are two continuous DNA molecules. But eukaryotic chromosomes are linear, not circular. So how does this cause a problem? In this diagram, we're looking at a replication fork that's opening up to the right. Helicase is moving left to right. In this case, our top strand of parental DNA, 
is 3 prime to 5 prime in the left to right direction. This would be the 3 prime end, and this would be the 5 prime end of that parental DNA molecule. So this newly synthesized daughter strand is being synthesized 5 prime to 3 prime in the same direction helicase is moving, so this would be our leading strand at the top. And at the bottom is the lagging strand that has to be copied in segments because synthesis is opposite the direction the helicase is moving. These short segments in red are the RNA primers that have not yet been removed. And the blue is the DNA that was added on by the eukaryotic equivalent of DNA polymerase 3. Now let's think about what has to happen when this bit of RNA gets chewed away enzymatically, and we now have a gap here in the sequence that needs to be filled. Down below, the picture is representing that we're a little bit further along in the replication process, and all the copying has been done. You can see the leading strand was fully copied all the way to the end, and on the lagging strand, RNA primers have to be removed. The eukaryotic equivalent of DNA polymerase 1 is going to bind to the end of this upstream DNA and extend it with DNA nucleotides to fill that gap until it runs into the Okazaki fragment ahead. We have a gap between these two segments, and we know that will be sealed by DNA ligase. Same thing will happen with this RNA primer. It'll be enzymatically removed, polymerase binds to the upstream DNA, and extends it, adding on to the 3' end. But what happens with this parental template at the 3' end? It hasn't been copied. Even if, for the sake of argument, somehow an RNA primer was laid down right at the very end of the template and extended, once it's removed, there's no DNA up here to extend to fill in that gap. We have a 3' prime end of the parental template DNA that cannot be replicated. This is what we mean by the end replication problem in eukaryotes. With every round of DNA replication, the very 3' prime ends of linear chromosomes cannot be copied, and so the newly produced daughter DNA molecule is going to have some missing sequence. It could be hundreds to thousands of nucleotides long, depending on how these fragments get laid down. Now why is this a problem? Well, what is DNA? DNA is the genetic instruction manual, the blueprint for life. These genetic sequences encode protein products, usually, that the cell requires in order to do all the work of a cell. If with every round of replication our DNA is getting shorter and shorter, Eventually what's going to happen is that the cell is going to start losing genetic sequence and genes and proteins that the cell needs to function. So how do eukaryotes deal with this problem? There's no way to stop the shortening from happening, but eukaryotic cells have a workaround to make it so that it doesn't matter. They enzymatically extend the three prime ends of their chromosomes with repetitive nonsense DNA that doesn't code for anything. Eukaryotic cells have an enzyme called telomerase that extends the three prime ends of chromosomes. In humans, normally this happens very early in embryonic development, and then telomerase gets switched off. The only exception is some stem cell populations that continually divide keep telomerase active. But for the majority of cell lineages in the body, the chromosome ends get extended in early development, and then shorten with every round of replication from then on. These extensions on the three prime ends of DNA added on by telomerase are referred to as telomeres. Let's take a look at the mechanism. Telomerase has two molecular components. There's the enzyme itself that synthesizes the DNA. That's represented here by this blue blob. The other component is an RNA template that the telomerase enzyme carries with it which you can see here going 5' prime to 3' prime, being held by the enzyme. This down here is the 3' prime end of the chromosome that's going to be extended. Because telomerase synthesizes DNA using an RNA template, it's referred to as a reverse transcriptase. Transcription, as you know, refers to copying DNA to build RNA. In this case, telomerase is doing the reverse, copying an RNA template to build DNA. What happens is that telomerase binds to the 3' end of the chromosome, matches up its RNA template with some complementary sequence at the very 3' end of the DNA, 
and then adds on to the three prime end, building the DNA complement of the RNA it's holding. So the sequence of the template is CCCAAUCCC, and the DNA that gets synthesized has the complementary sequence GGGTTAGGG. Once that's added on, the telomerase shifts to the three prime end again, matches up to the complementary sequence, and extends over and over and over again until thousands of copies have been added. And depending on what eukaryotic organism you're looking at, you're going to have different specific sequences. This happens to be the sequence in human, but other organisms will have different specific sequences. Once that DNA has been extended, this end of the chromosome actually folds back on itself and forms a loop and is bound by a set of proteins to form a capped telomere structure. It's kind of analogous to the aglet on the end of your shoelace. The aglet protects the shoelace from fraying and the capped telomere is protective as well. I'll come back to that in a minute. Once again, this extension doesn't get rid of the end replication issue. The cell still can't replicate the three prime end, but it makes it so that it doesn't matter. The cell isn't losing real genetic sequence. It's just failing to replicate this repetitive DNA that's been added on. Now, as I said, under normal circumstances, the only time we see telomerase active is early in embryonic development. When an early embryo is formed, telomerase is activated, and in every cell in that early embryo, the three prime ends of those chromosomes get elongated. Then telomerase shuts off. From that point on, those three prime ends are going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. The exception to that, again, under normal circumstances, is that special population, the stem cells. Stem cells are undifferentiated populations of cells that divide throughout the life of the organism and are constantly replenishing and replacing particular cell populations in the body. They are unspecialized and their whole job is to divide and produce other populations of cells that will differentiate and specialize for different tasks. In stem cells, telomerase remains active and maintains chromosome length. But other than that, under normal circumstances, telomerase shuts off in early development. As I mentioned, telomeres are protective, and they protect the cell in a number of ways. First, as we just discussed, they protect against the effects of the end replication problem. But they also protect chromosomes against end joining. End joining is a DNA repair process that has evolved to prevent loss of DNA if a DNA molecule breaks. If a cell sees a naked end of DNA, it reads that as a broken DNA molecule, and rather than lose that genetic material and any instructions it might contain, the cell initiates a repair process where it takes that DNA end and fuses it to another chromosome in the cell, sort of at random. This makes a kind of logical sense. Even though sticking two bits of DNA together could potentially damage one or the other or both, that's preferable to losing important DNA. So end joining is a kind of a last ditch effort to save the DNA. The capped telomeres at the ends of chromosomes prevent the cell from inappropriately recognizing a chromosome end and initiating end joining repair to attempt to save it, which would cause chromosome fusion. Telomeres also protect against having cell lineages in the body with too many mutations. As we talked about before, during replication, mutations get introduced. The process is not perfect. We have proofreading polymerases and mismatch and other repair pathways that fix as many of these mutations as possible, but they don't catch them all. With every round of replication, more mutations get introduced into the genome and the likelihood that an important gene could undergo mutation and potentially harm the organism goes up. Telomere length at the molecular level is a mechanism for sensing how many replications a DNA molecule has been subjected to, and therefore how many mutations it's likely to contain. The more mutations, the more dangerous. These protein caps on the telomeres are stable as long as the telomeres are sufficiently long. But after many rounds of shortening, these ends get shorter and shorter, and eventually they reach a critically short length that can no longer maintain that cap. This can be dangerous because without a capped telomere, the cell could mistake that chromosome end 
for broken DNA and join it to another chromosome, resulting in chromosome fusion, which you can see illustrated here and in this microscopy image on the right. That's very, very bad. It leads to inability to correctly segregate chromosomes, broken chromosomes, genome instability. It's just all around bad news for the cell. So under normal circumstances, once telomeres start approaching that critically short length, that initiates signaling pathways in the cell that will take it in one of two directions, either programmed cell death via apoptosis or senescence, a quiescent state aging cells go into in which the cell will never divide again. Essentially, it exits from the cell cycle and goes to G0. Which pathway gets triggered depends on the cell type. This response makes logical sense, and we can definitely see the advantage of this kind of regulation. So if this is the case, how do we end up with a disease like cancer in which cells divide and divide and divide uncontrollably and essentially lose this limitation, becoming immortal in a sense? Well, it turns out that cancer cells very commonly reactivate telomerase and re-extend their chromosome ends, allowing them to escape this regulatory mechanism that would otherwise prevent them from dividing and causing harm. Because they escape this regulation, they can continue to divide, continue to accumulate mutations and more and more DNA damage, which can become even more dangerous. This makes telomerase a very interesting subject for cancer researchers, because if they can prevent that reactivation, or somehow target telomerase in those cells, that could be a powerful cancer-fighting tool. Research suggests that senescence, or aging at the organismal level, is closely related to this aging at the cellular level. Because what is aging? Essentially, it's a deviation from homeostasis, where the organism accumulates damage and loses more cells than it can replace. It stops growing, loses mass and strength, becomes less robust and less fertile, progressively loses function in all body systems, and ultimately gives out and dies. Cheery thought, I know. The more cells are undergoing programmed cell death and entering a senescent state, the less regeneration is happening. Now, short telomeres aren't the only thing that triggers cellular senescence and aging. Other types of cellular damage do as well, including oxidative damage and extensive protein misfolding, among others. Some think it's possible to turn back the clock and reverse aging by controlling and reversing this DNA and cellular damage that accrues over a lifetime, and maybe even extend the human lifespan to 150 years, 200 years, or beyond. They may be right. After all, some organisms don't age at all. It can be hard to imagine this from our human perspective, but there are organisms that exhibit negligible senescence. They get older, obviously, but they don't seem to have any detectable signs of aging. They keep growing, they stay strong, maintain function, they don't lose fertility and may even become more fertile as they get older. Examples from the animal world include sturgeon, rockfish, and lobsters, and there are lots of examples in the plant world, like the bristlecone pines, some of which have been alive for almost 5,000 years, and as far as we can tell, don't show any loss of vigor. Now, interestingly, lobsters, at least, maintain telomerase activity in all their cells throughout their life. Could that be one reason why they don't appear to age? Given its potential role in aging and its central importance in human disease, it's easy to understand why telomerase and telomeres are such an important topic of research. The structure of human telomerase was only recently solved in 2018 by the research groups of Kathleen Collins and Evan Wen at UC Berkeley. You can see it in all its glory here. Knowing the structure of the enzyme is incredibly useful and informative for intelligent drug design targeting the enzyme. So this could potentially lead to new therapeutics. Stay tuned.